I'm Mona Charon. I'm a syndicated columnist. I write for National Review Online, and I'm a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. In a better world, universities would be the crowning glory of our civilization. They would take students from every background, color, ethnicity, and both sexes, and yes, despite what you've heard lately, there are only two sexes, and introduce them to what the 19th century British educator Matthew Arnold called the best that has been thought and written. There remain many fine scholars who write and teach at our universities. There are even professors who see their jobs pretty much the way Matthew Arnold described it, and who wouldn't dream of abusing their authority by attempting to indoctrinate their students. But they are a minority. Our universities today are crippled by political correctness. Propaganda masquerades as scholarship. Dissenters are met with ridicule and even worse. This past graduation season, at least half a dozen colleges chose to withdraw invitations to speakers who dared to challenge liberal orthodoxy. Worst of all, honest scholarship on some subjects has become difficult to publish. So I implore you to hold tight to your skepticism. Take nothing on faith. Your mind and imagination are your own, and no amount of intellectual bullying can prevent you from checking out other opinions. Above all, check the facts, because much of what you're being taught is not true. The received wisdom on college campuses is tendentious on many subjects. On the subject of racism and colonialism, for example, progressives fall victim to a kind of reverse chauvinism, suggesting that racism, exploitation, and man's inhumanity to man, sins and crimes that characterize the whole of human history, were somehow at their worst in Western civilization. The same is true of sexism. In fact, on no subject is there more misinformation, myth, and rigid orthodoxy than on the matter of sex and sexuality. It has become conventional wisdom on campuses and in progressive circles that nearly all observed differences in behavior between men and women are socially constructed, that is, merely the effect of socialization. If we would simply raise boys and girls with exactly the same expectations, the reasoning goes, virtually all differences between the sexes would disappear. As George Orwell said, some ideas are so absurd that only an intellectual could believe them. Reams of psychological, neurological, and physiological research demonstrate sex differences in the brains of males and females are, show up early. From the first minutes after birth, for example, male and female babies show markedly different tendencies. Baby girls will stare longer at the image of a human face, whereas boys will look more intently at moving objects. Men possess a stronger ability to think of objects in three dimensions, helping with navigation. Even three-month-old infants exhibit this sex-based behavioral difference. Women produce only about half as much serotonin, a neurotransmitter linked to depression, as men do, and they have fewer transporters to recycle it. Perhaps as a result, women tend to worry more. Studies have shown that infant girls speak sooner and use more words than infant boys. Infant girls also respond more to the sound of another infant in distress than do boys. If you look at those indisputable facts and conclude that sexist socialization is the only explanation, I submit that you are a women's studies professor. Acknowledging the biological and psychological differences between the sexes, in other words, dealing with scientific truth and not some androgynous, make-believe world, is essential to understanding where feminism went wrong and what it really should be. A feminism that is truly focused on what is good for women's happiness and fulfillment would not reject the family, as most feminists in the Western world have done for the past half century or more. The General Social Survey has shown that women today are actually less happy with their lives than the women were 40 years ago. Feminism placed educational attainment, financial success, independence, and so-called empowerment in places of honor. Education and financial success are great, of course, but independence is a misplaced value. Women are constantly warned not to become dependent upon men, but is that really the best road to a fulfilled and rounded life? In fact, 
Both men and women need commitment, stability, dignity, and tenderness in their romantic lives and in all their intimate relationships in order to be their best and happiest selves. And children need two married parents to flourish. Of course, women should plan to depend on men, just as men depend upon women and children upon their parents. Unlike most feminist theorists, actual women are not dissatisfied with motherhood or the demands of children. The vast majority of mothers want to combine work and family. 53% of married mothers say that part-time work is ideal, and another 23% prefer to be stay-at-home moms. Feminism has subtracted from the sum total of happiness in our time by pitting women against men. They've suggested that fulfillment is some sort of zero-sum game, wherein the advancement of women must come at the expense of men and vice versa. A true feminism would focus on helping women to be successful in work and school, but also on building strong marriages, which are the foundation of happy families and thriving communities. It was such a tragic mistake for feminists to disdain the family and endorse promiscuity. It took thousands of years of civilization to evolve norms that required men to govern their own natures enough to meet the needs of women and children. Through marriage, men agree to forswear any other sexual partners and remain with one woman and the children that they create together for a lifetime. That was very much to the advantage of women. The decline of marriage has hurt both sexes. Married men and women are healthier, wealthier, and happier than single, widowed, or divorced adults. They are less likely to get post-surgical complications, less likely to consult psychiatrists, less likely to die in accidents, and less likely to abuse drugs or alcohol. Among all women, the very least likely to be victims of domestic violence are married women. Married men tend to earn more money than single men, as much as 44% more after controlling for age, IQ, education, experience, race, and, a num and the number of children. Economists call it the marriage premium. And married couples report the highest level of sexual satisfaction. Married couples enjoy more financial security, have longer lives, and raise children who have far better chances of being happy, productive, and successful than the children raised by single parents. When children are raised outside of marriage, they are nearly always raised by single mothers. The life of a woman attempting to raise kids on her own is a very stressful one. Many women do a heroic job of it, but it's exceedingly difficult. True feminists should be about attempting to minimize, not increase, the likelihood that a woman will have to manage a full-time job raising kids and looking after aging parents by herself. A full life for women as well as men includes a stable family, a supportive community, and rewarding work. The retreat from marriage has weakened communities, alienated millions of men from their children, and left women not having it all, but doing it all alone. The best kind of feminism would recognize that women, children, and yes, men deserve better.